as athletes, as gymnasts, and as people who um, take an interest in sport and exercise science, we're always looking for ways to improve our performance, ways to make sure that we're higher, that we're faster, and that we're stronger than we were yesterday so that we can keep progressing. A lot of the time, when you're training, even very small improvements in performance take huge amounts of time, effort, and dedication. But sometimes, it can actually be very, very easy. Sometimes, a big improvement in performance and a big difference to your training can be achieved just through applying logic and training smart. What if I told you that there was a way for you to gain an extra 20 minutes of training in each session without staying in the gym for a minute longer? What if I told you that there was a way you could improve your leg power, your running speed and your jumping height by about 5-10% to 10 without doing any leg conditioning? What if I told you that there was a way that you could improve your balance and reduce your risk of injury? Surely, any gymnast, trampolinist, tumbler or tricker who cares at all about their training would be mad to ignore such advice. What if I told you that simply by not stretching at the start of each session, all of these benefits could be yours? Now that might sound like a bit of a bold claim, particularly if you're somebody who's been in gymnastics for a long time, but please bear with me. This is something which I feel quite passionately about and something I've implemented into my own training. It's something which I've researched in quite some detail as well. All I'm asking is for a few minutes of your time in the hope that I will win you over. You can do what you like with this information, but I really hope that those of you who take it in and use it appropriately see um, a positive effect. The first thing to understand is the difference between pre-session stretching and flexibility training. At no point in this video am I going to say that flexibility isn't important. Of course, flexibility is hugely important to a lot of skills which we do in gymnastics. But there is a big difference which some people get confused between, between pre-session stretching and flexibility training. Pre-session stretching is a fairly light ordeal. It aims to just kind of loosen your body and your muscles up to their maximum range of motion again and prepare your body for what you're about to put it through. Flexibility training, on the other hand, aims to push the range of motion at that particular joint further than it's been before um, to actually increase your flexibility for your next training session. The best warm-up protocol which you can implement is to do five to ten minutes of fairly light sub-maximal exercise such as running or a game or whatever you, whatever you would normally do for your warm-up and then follow that by um, a dynamic stretching protocol which should take you no more than three to five minutes. Your flexibility training, where you will push your static stretch to the point of discomfort and hold it for an extended period of time, should be done towards the end of the session. You're going to go further in that stretch for relatively less effort at the end of the session anyway, because your body's warm. But on top of that, it's going to mean that it doesn't particularly matter if you damage your muscles a little bit, because you haven't got any more training to do afterwards and you've got time to recover before your next session. The overwhelming body of scientific evidence at this point suggests that static stretching before power activities, including gymnastics, is a bad idea. And that's regardless of the age, gender or the baseline flexibility levels of the people involved. For this reason, most um, kind of governing bodies and high level coaches will recommend the use of it. But still, um, we struggle to get club level coaches and athletes to buy into this recommendation. The reason for this is simply because people are resistant to change. It's not the way that they were taught when they were younger and it's simply not what they're used to. I think as coaches and athletes it's our responsibility to not be stuck in our ways, to try and be receptive to new information so that our next generation of athletes and coaches can progress and learn more effectively. Just like any other area of science, sports science is constantly changing and evolving. Sure enough, static stretching may well have been the recommendation before an exercise session 20 years ago, but times have changed and the mentality of the majority of our coaches and gymnasts hasn't, and in some ways that is holding us back. Your muscles are attached to your bones by tendons. Okay? When your muscle contracts, it pulls on the tendon, which pulls on the bone, which causes your limb to move. When you stretch, your muscles and your tendons get longer and they loosen. This means that when your muscle contracts, there is a less effective transfer of force 
from the muscle through to the bone, which means for a given amount of contraction, there is not only less movement produced at the bone, but there is slower movement produced at the bone, which means that temporarily, you are less able to produce the maximum amount of power that your muscle is capable of. Now this effect can last for as long as 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how um, intense your warm-up stretching routine is. Um, an hour could obviously be the majority of your training session, your muscles are only working at 90 to 95% of their maximum. As well as this mechanical change to your muscles and tendons, static stretching causes a neurological inhibition to the muscles which you're stretching. When you hold the static stretch, it stimulates um, intrafusal fibres, which are things like your Golgi tendon organs and your muscle spindles, which sit in the muscle belly. Um, and through various very complicated neurological pathways, which I'm not going to go into too much detail in, um, the muscle actually becomes less excitable. It becomes less able to respond and contract in response to descending inputs from the uh, motor nervous system. Against what you may currently be thinking, static stretching has also been found to be detrimental before performing flexibility-based skills such as leaping on floor and beam. A study um, involving rhythmic gymnasts asked rhythmic gymnasts to perform three different variations of a split beep. Um, one group did a warm-up and one group did a warm-up with a static stretching protocol. Um, the height of these jumps was recorded in both groups and also a panel of expert judges um, judged the aesthetic quality of the, the jumps which were performed. The judges were blinded to which um, group the gymnasts had been put in so they didn't know whether they'd done any static stretching or not before their performance. Not only was the height of the leaps lower in the static stretching group but the scores which the judges awarded them was also lower meaning that static stretching has a direct detrimental effect on the performance of leaps on floor. Now, the, the lack of amplitude of the jump is deductible in itself, but because there was less power in the gymnast's legs to achieve that height, the end position which they achieved wasn't quite right either, and that was obviously deductible as well, and resulted in quite a noticeable drop in score in the static stretching group. Dynamic stretching is actually considered a better warm-up strategy before performing leaps because it's more specific to the action which you're about to do. In a leap, it's a very, very fast action which is not held for any period of time, which is the same as what you would do in a dynamic stretch. I've read several papers examining the effect of a static stretching protocol on um, measures of maximum leg power and jumping ability, um, jumping height and various other parameters such as that and pretty consistently a 5 to 10 percent reduction in maximum height or power is seen after a bout of static stretching. I didn't find any papers specifically on it but it seems fairly reasonable to assume that upper body static stretches might reduce the maximum power of your upper body by 5 to 10 percent as well which obviously has implications for performance on strength events such as rings. Both standing jumps and rebounding jumps were found to be lower after static stretching protocols. Not only were the rebounding jumps lower, but video analysis showed that the gymnasts spent more time on the floor, implying that their rebound off the floor was a little bit more sluggish. And this has obvious implications for your ability to tumble on the floor, particularly when performing um, combination tumbles that rebound out of each other. Another study found that after static stretching, gymnasts were less able to run as fast when performing a vault. Their run-up time slowed down compared to a group of people who had just warmed up. The authors of most of these studies kind of acknowledge that a reduction of 5-10% to 10 is probably not going to result in any um, observable difference for novice or recreational gymnasts. But in higher level gymnasts, a 5-10% to 10 reduction in jump height or in run-up speed could well be the difference between landing a new skill and under-rotating it dangerously or falling over in a competition. Another study even presented evidence that static stretching before a session reduces your ability to balance, which obviously has um, negative connotations for your ability to perform on events such as the beam. Um, when your muscles and tendons are elongated, as we mentioned earlier, um, there's a more slow transfer of force between the muscle and the, the actual movement of the limb. 
So that may mean that your body is less able to react to perturbations in your equilibrium and you're more likely to fall off balance. As well as reducing your ability to stay on the beam, a less reactive um, autonomic nervous system and less efficient muscle reactions may mean that your body is less able to um, protectively react against kind of stressful body positions and may even mean that static stretching at the start of a session makes injuries such as knee hyperextension or ankle rolling a little bit more likely. I'm going to go out on a limb here and go against conventional logic and say that not only is static stretching at the start of a session detrimental in terms of leg power and height when you jump, but it is also actually increasing your risk of injury, raising the temperature of your body and your muscles through your submaximal aerobic warm-up at the start of the session is by far the best thing you can do short term to actually reduce your risk of injury. On top of all the physiological reasons I've presented to you so far why static stretching at the start of a session is a bad idea, the time that it wastes is probably one of the main reasons why I'm against it. Static stretching can be done absolutely anywhere and at any time. So I don't understand why people choose to spend 20, even 30 minutes of their time in an actual gymnastics facility doing it. It would be a much more efficient use of time, in my opinion, to warm up in 10 minutes and then get on the apparatus quickly um, so that you can use the equipment which you don't have at home whilst you're actually there. People who train with me will know that I rarely, if ever, stretch when I'm actually in the gym, but I've managed to maintain a pretty reasonable degree of flexibility. I'm flexible enough for everything that I need to do. And that's because I spend a couple of sessions each week at home stretching when I find the time. And I don't really think that anybody who is serious about their sport is too busy to find two 10 minute slots throughout their week at home to do a little bit of stretching. The final reason which I'll present to you why I don't think static stretching is a good idea is a little bit of food for thought. Um, I don't think static stretching should be done at the start of recreational classes for children because they don't enjoy it. As adults and as coaches we lie to them and say that it's essential and if you don't stretch your body you're going to hurt yourself when all of the scientific evidence is suggesting that that's actually not the case. Is it possible that if less stretching was done at the start of recreational gymnastics sessions and kids got straight onto the apparatus a little bit earlier, is it possible that fewer people would drop out as children and more recreational gymnasts would enjoy gymnastics enough to want to take it up to the next level? I don't have the answer to that question, but I've got a fair inclination that it would certainly help. I will finish this video off by demonstrating a quick all over body dynamic stretching protocol which you can do fairly easily at the start of a session to prepare your body for gymnastics um, within just a couple of minutes without actually doing any static stretching whatsoever. I've put all the references to all the papers which I read in order to put this video together in the description of this video so if you want to do any further reading um, the links are down there, please go ahead. I haven't covered everything in enormous detail in this video by any stretch, just purely on the interest of time. The video is kind of long enough as it is. So there is much more information for you guys to find out. I just gave you the, the take home messages. If you have any opinions, questions or comments, then please um, drop them down below. Um, I'm more than happy to ask questions and to have intelligent debates with people. And if you found the video useful, please consider sharing it with um, somebody else who you think may benefit from this information, a fellow gymnast or coach perhaps. Thank you very much.